What land were we moving to? What land were we moving from? Over the rolling plains, a dew-drenched barbware foliage. We cross field borders, we cross wheat fields. My sister and my parents, village folk, and next to them, me, princess, or Priyobala. Mapa called me princess. The school called me Priyobala. Merely into two or three classes, someone in the village cried, run, all of you run. We fled, the whole village with us. We fled, Ma, Pa, and two sisters, through the thicket, through the rotting river, past the slipping thatches. Welcome to the first ever virtual poetry session of Antonym Web Magazine. This is Jishnu Sen from Michigan, is your host today. In this session, we will mainly focus on poems influenced by immigrant and refugee experience and memories. Let me say a few words about the antonym. The antonym has created a unique place among English magazines to attract new English speaking world and diasporic population globally with culture rich content, emphasizing sense of place and sense of belonging using a contemporary design blended with media. The long term and the growing body of evidence on migration and mobility shows that migration is in large part related to the broader global economic, social, political, and technological transformations. As the process of globalization deepen, these transformations increasingly shape our lives, in our workplaces, in our homes, in our social and spiritual lives as we go about our daily routines. So today, we are very lucky to have three guest poets from different parts of the world, from Europe, from California, from New York. And we will hear from them directly, their poems or a translated poems, and probably some thoughts, some backgrounds, why they're interested uh, to write the, on these areas. So let me first, without any further uh, <clears throat> me talking, introduce the, our three poets. Um, first, I'm introducing Professor Pascal Verdicio. He, born in Napoli, Italy, Pascal Verdicio emigrated with his family to Canada as a teenager. He completed a PhD at UCLA and taught at the University of California, San Diego. He has long list of poetry, translations, and academic publications to his name, including Antonio Gramici's Southern Question and works by Alda Merini, Vivian Lamarck, Pier Paolo Pasoloni, and Andrea Zanzotto. Thank you very much for the opportunity to read uh, this morning. This uh, poem is entitled The Lights of Lampedusa. Lampedusa is uh, the first port of call uh, for migrants arriving across the Mediterranean. And this is a, a history of, uh, that is uh, fairly recent in the news, I think in North America, but has been going on for many years. And during these crossings over these years, tens of thousands of refugees coming across the Mediterranean have lost their lives. So this poem reflects, is my meditation on that. The Lights of Lampedusa. Night rain washes stars from the sky until it seems so dark that features disappear against the rolling seas, against our better judgment, gone now without resource, away from familiar smells of home received into darkness without direction, carrying blessings and charms familiar to the touch, even when, when sight fails, when rain falls, thick as smoke, it's soot upon the skin with the salt of travel, tightly packed onto a sinking ship, despair locked into our throats, hallucinating ears, catch a sound of land confusing doom with hope, starboard with port, night with blindness. And the night rains down on shoulders of fear 
lightning, blood, and tears, voices practiced with the words of the dead, voices of the voiceless that walked on air, eyes filled with shadows, shades of death, falling with the rain. Shrouds lined up on the floor of a large warehouse, draped bodies filled a frame of news photos, an incident, an accident, a tragedy, too many, a crystal installation, a commemoration with metaphorical reference, remembrance, but it's not. And it has happened before, again and again and again, after this with the dead body beyond belief, but once again swept under the rug. Facebook folks post photographs, rescue scenes, photographs, dead lined up on the beach where others are sunning in the still warm autumn weather. Posting photographs of the great migration, a reminder of history and decks of ships back to the gills with those who were then unwelcome, unwanted, but necessary, unwanted, but useful, cheap labor, future acculturation. These immigrant masses, those images, a history forgotten, buried, denied and revised. Today to mean again, Italiani brava gente. Facebook hard to face today with the lack of understanding, stubborn repetition of commonplaces, wanton disregard, disguised as compassion. What now? Count the wounds carried across the sea that will not part, will not provide a space of, deadly, of daily bread, of speech and memory. There are no lines to draw from one place to another. We are not of this world with drowned houses and smothered calls. We continue to live a nightmare of rejection and enclosure, a spring without flowers haunted by invisible borders, merely lines that challenge the beauty of the world. We live in the depths. The horizon has risen up to smother us. We are abandoned ships without name and domicile. Besides this mass grave carefully maintained as a reminder of our non-existence. It's beautiful. Um, so so uh, uh, I know that you mentioned that it's from the Mediterranean and that, that time. So can you uh, elaborate a little bit? So we are abandoned ships without name and domicile beside this mass grave carefully mentioned as a reminder of our non-existence. Um, can you explain that a little more? It will be good for the audience, I believe. Yes, well, um, many of the boats, ships, some, but very sm mostly small boats that uh, most m of the migrants coming across uh, embark upon are, are rickety boats and ships. Um, and so the abandoned ships refers both to the type of vessel that they're bringing across but also the, uh, the people that are on them. Uh, they have aban abandoned their home in order to find opportunity elsewhere. They themselves are abandoned to some extent by the authorities in all the places that they cross. Um, and without name and domicile, often when they are found at sea because they've perished, or when they arrive, uh, they tend not to identify with their own uh, name. Mm -hmm. They tend to abandon documents as a way of avoiding being repatriated, if that's even a good word, because of course they left behind places that were not, uh, they did not feel uh, a part of. Um, and the mass grave is um, obviously the, uh, again, tens of thousands have perished over the years. And so the Mediterranean has, uh, be, has become a sort of mass grave of unnamed individuals, um, which uh, further emphasizes the non-existence of many of these migrants, um, both in history because they no longer have a voice, and for, for the people who will, will, will not uh, willingly, uh, voluntarily receive them because they're not always welcome in the place of their arrival, whether it be Italy or other places in Europe. There's a short documentary made by an Ethiopian uh, refugee, Dagmawi Yimer, uh, that commemorates one of these, uh, one of the first uh, 
um, of such uh, tragedies where over 300 people lost their lives. Uh, unfortunately, that's become a small tragedy if there's a way of, of right. even, even saying that tragedy Same. is smaller than another um, because of so many people that have, uh, have, have died over the years. So that's sort of the background to all this. Thank you. Very helpful. I appreciate that. So <clears throat> Patrick Williamson lives near Paris uh, in France. Probably today he's in Italy, but in vacationing. But uh, He's a poet and a literary translator and has published a dozen works. Latest collection, Traversi, Beneficato, Hold Your Tongue, and Nel Santuario. Editor and translator of the Parletry, an anthology of poets from French-speaking Africa and the Arab world, and translated notably Tahar Bakery, Gillesier, Gudo Kupani, and Eri de Luca. Again, welcome, Patrick. And if you, um, I know probably you will today um, cite some translated poems. So if you can also add the actual um, poets some background, and also if you can give a little bit of um, uh, kind of um, elaborate that why you motivated to translate th that poet, that his, his or her work, that would be great. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Jishnu. It's very kind. Um, I'm going to read, to begin with, two um, translations that I've done of the Italian writer, um, Eri De Luca. He's a very well-known, um, renowned writer in Italy. He's done many novels, plays, essays, and um, some poetry as well. And um, it happened that, again, back in about four or five years ago when the migrant crisis um, broke out in the media very much and there's a lot and lots of attention on the migrants crossing um, the Mediterranean that I became interested in the subject of migration and of the idea of people who had to move from one continent to the other for the various reasons. And it happened at that time um, that I was in Rome and I went to a, um, a book fair, which is called Pew Libri, Pew Libri in December 2015. And I heard Eri De Luca present his work with lots of humor, lots of Neapolitan anecdotes. And during the event, he recited his, what, what I would call a lake pr prayer for migrants which is Mare Nostro che non si ne cieli. My Italian is not very good, but that's you can get the idea, uh, which I translate as our sea, which art not in heaven. And I was very interested in the poem because it had a great resonance regarding the subject and the text itself. Um, I found interesting, not only for the, the subject matter, but for the compassion with which he expresses this um, tragedy that has been, it continues all the time, but obviously it's gone a little bit more into the background. So I decided to translate that. I don't normally translate very much from Italian, but I have started doing that um, since then. Um, so I'm going to read this, that poem to begin with. Um, and then subsequently, I decided well, I was interested in his work and I came across a sequence which is called Solo Andata, uh, which is from his second book of poetry, which again is a series of poems um, relating the story of immigrants from Africa and their voyage from Africa to arrive in Italy. Um, it's what's called, a, what I would call a, a lament from immigrants from Africa, trying to make it across the Mediterranean to Italy. Um, so I've translated that sequence and I'm going to read one of the poems um, from that sequence uh, where he talks about their journey from Africa over the ocean, uh, over the sea and their arrival in Italy and the kind of, uh, how would I say, unwelcome that they don't, that they get. In other words, they're not really 
um, welcomed in and they, they end up in a place which is not what they were, were looking for. Um, there are lots of stories in his sequence, but I will just take one. So to begin with, um, I'm going to read the Lake Prayer Mare Nostro Kinon Si Nijem. Our sea, which art not in heaven, and embrace the borders of the island and the world, blessed be your salt, blessed be your seabed, welcome the crowded boats without a root over your waves, the fishermen gone out at night, their nets amid your creatures, that come back in the morning with their catch of castaways saved. Our sea, which art not in heaven, at dawn the colour of wheat, at sunset like ripening grape, we have sown you with drowned bodies, more than at any time of tempest. You are more righteous than the land, even when you raise waves as walls, than flatten them as carpet. Keep the knives, the callers fallen like leaves on the path, be an autumn for them. A hug, a caress, a kiss on the brow of father and mother before leaving. Beautiful. It is a very, you could feel the kind of sense that he understands their pain and their, right. um, um, how would I say, their kind of um anguish the fact that they have to move across to another country and the dangerous journey that they are taking and he also speaks to them in a sense because they have no voice they are inarticulate so he is putting the words right. into their um bringing them to life and this is again something that i found again with solo and data that you feel yourself uh, being with the, the migrants as they are crossing and understanding so. more about that. So I'm going to read the section um, from um, Solo and Data, which okay. comes about in the middle of the text. It's right. divided up into, into a series um, of voices, one of which is a chorus, which comes from time to time, and then one man's voice, six men's voices, etc. And I've taken just a section which is called Chorus um, in the center. The men left their prayers on land. Everyone's God is not to blame for the journey. No invocation, no plea for help from here, only a greeting to the king of the universe. If we were on land all these nights, we'd sing for her and smooth to the highlands. We'd drive the lions away with song. Women would tend to the fire in the stone circle. Our bodies do not cast shadows on ground here. We are dust raised, a vinegary smell in an empty flask. We are the desert that walks, people of sand, iron in our blood, lime in eyes, a leather sheath. Many destroyed lives paved the way for the journey. Steps we stole from others push our feet forward. Beautiful, beautiful. I mean, though I, I obviously it's just translated, I think you did a ter terrific job. I mean, I don't know. I mean, as a translate, as you are translating these things, how difficult, because we always hear that if you read the poem or any writing or any novel in the actual language, who is the person, right? And we are translating, sometimes you lose something. So what is your experience in there? I mean, I mean, you, you know both the language. I don't know. I, I, I'm only listening or reading your, it's beautiful though. Yeah, it, it sounds very nice, yeah. So do you have any thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, um, well, yes, obviously every, every time you do translation, especially for poetry, there is something that is right. lost in translation as people say. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also a challenge in order to um, bring out the inner meaning and the music and the, um, the subtext in the, to bring it out and to present it in another language. So you're recreating it in, in a slightly different way, but I think it's, um, 
always quite satisfying when you find a way in order to express it um, in the way that comes across, I think, in, in, in the other language. Um, Eria de Luca is actually quite difficult because he has a very strong Neapolitan um, oh, okay. language mm -hmm. full of very sort of harsh staccato kind of text. Okay. Um, he's, he's extremely well read, uh, so he uses lots of um, poetic tropes and mm -hmm. other uh, um, techniques. He's done a lot of translation himself. He translates from ancient Hebrew, Swahili, Russian, Yiddish, and indeed in this particular solo andata text, he uses some of the words from Swahili because he learned he learned that. So there's a lot of challenge in order to um, try to keep the kind of harshness of the language, and at the same time, he also has a story behind it, talking Correct. about these different voices and during the journey there is a fight between the people on them because um, often when we the, um, the people who are traveling uh, who, who are migrating they are um, there are smugglers who take them on the journey and therefore there is a kind of conflict between the people who are um, fixing them fixing the journey and the people who are being um, transported so there's a, there was a story behind it, not only the, um, the immigrants leaving Africa to go to uh, Italy and Europe, that journey, but inside that there was a secondary uh, narrative of how they um, interacted with the smugglers who were taking them on the journey. I think that's also quite an interesting um, angle to try to bring out. Okay, so we have, um, thank you. Yeah, Patrick, again, it's beautiful. Um, so, um, so we also have with us, we are lucky to have a poet and writer, uh, Samantha Terrell. Uh, Samantha Terrell is the author of Vision and Other Things We Hide From, is an internationally published American poet whose work emphasizes self-awareness as a means to social awareness. Terrell's poetry can be found in many of the publications and has been featured on Sunny G Radio in Glasgow, the Dublin-based East the Storms podcast, the Open Collaborations All Acoustics show in Bristol, UK, and other forums. Raised in the Midwest United States, she now writes from her home in upstate New York. Find her online at samanthaterrell.com, that is S-A-M-A-N-T-H-A-T-E-R-R-E-L-L, -L dot com. Again, welcome Samantha. From, uh, thank you very much for joining. And um, yeah, also as we are doing poetry session and looks like it will quite change because Samantha will, it, it, we are mostly uh, heard so far immigration from Africa to Europe through Mediterranean. It will be totally a different flavor probably Samantha will bring. So it will have a nice yeah. Thank you, Jishnu. I was so, um grateful for uh, some of the emails that went back and forth between the two of us uh, and helping me sort out what to read today. I, um, my ancestors immigrated to America over 200 years ago, so I come at this for, from a different perspective, than maybe right. some do, but um, right. as you mentioned, it's also a different perspective for me in America because the news that I hear and know about um, is primarily related to immigration to America. So I like hearing about the struggles um, in Europe and remembering that this is a global issue. And um, I, I loved hearing those other poems. Those were so beautiful. Um, so I am a social justice poet. So that's primarily what interests me in the topic. Um, and I wanted to read, I wanted to read first um, a poem that I wrote that I dedicated to the DACA dreamers. Um, so in America, the children who are born to um, immigrants that have not gone through their um, immigration process yet. And uh, I wrote this a few years ago, but I hope that it, it kind of resonates with the topic today. It's called Identification. 
A mother carries her child's identity, genes imprinted on cells as nine months of safety transpire. Mother bears her child's identity in her relentlessly burdened heart, full of hopes and woes. And if she is lucky enough, she's got her child's identity, a social security card tucked safely in a wallet slot. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I am very aware of DACA, though we, we know that it has not been a rule yet to give them uh, immigration status, those who are the actual tussle going on in the, you probably know that um, between the Senate and everything, it's beautiful. So, so, so you wrote probably a few years back, right? Yeah, I did. I wrote yeah. that one a few years back. I know that they have had some progress, um, mm. try to keep up with the news, but um, yeah, I think, I think that it continues to be a struggle. And I can only imagine as a parent who maybe was forced into this position to right. come here and then your child is born here and you don't have your immigration status resolved and your child doesn't have their immigration status resolved that must be um you know so troublesome right uh, and 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 maybe it's a question to all of you especially to samantha that um as now i believe the technology has progressed so much in this type of immigration um the actual identity, um, do you think that maybe 50, 60 years back, the identity problem, if you were an immigrant to come to a new country, is same now uh, still, or it is much more kind of easier or to uh, adjust with the new country because the technology is so much um, advanced and it is now many, many countries uh, have kind of the same facilities what what the maybe the richer country have. I mean, what what's your uh, feel on that, Samantha? Well, um, as I say, and I don't want to insert myself in a conversation that is not appropriate, having not been there personally. But I would guess that there are some things that are going to be the same throughout history. Um, you're coming from a different place. You have to learn a different culture, maybe a different language. Um, those things would probably remain the same um, as far as the challenges for immigration. But in terms of technology, maybe it is easier to navigate some of the language barriers. There are apps that help us with that now. Um, maybe it's easier to find resources online. Um, you know, this is just, again, this would be my guess. Um, but I do, since I write from that social justice perspective, I am I have a minor in history and I'm always thinking from the historical context that humans are humans and the challenges that we experience um, are often the same, right. you know, right. throughout history, so. Right. Um, um. You know, I just uh, have an example of uh, something that really struck me. Um, one thing that I th seems to be more available now is language classes, which didn't exist when we I'd arrived say. in Canada. <laughs> and so, of course, uh, it forced me to learn language uh, through incredible, uh, in, uh, how do you call it, immersion. <laughs> But uh, I, re I just retired. So yesterday I received a form from Social Security to fill out and just trying to figure out how to fill that form. And I know that they come in different languages, but it again, sort of brought up the difficulties that someone who does not speak the language as I hope I speak well, but my, my own parents having to deal with that sort of thing. So even though the technology exists elsewhere, the fact of going into a new language and a different type of bureaucratic language on top of that, um, the difficulties remain uh, to a great extent. And certainly the parents and the children, the DACA children, still find those difficulties, I think, today. So despite the advances that uh, I think everyone has made, everyone has a cell phone and internet, it seems, in most parts of the world, right? Right. Um, That's, yeah. But still, <laughs> when you're dealing with bureaucracy, 
there are so many obstacles. And the first one is language. Uh, so that's just something that hit me yesterday when I got this form. And I, I, I found it frustrating. <laughs> so I can't imagine how someone whose language is not up to, uh, you know, fluency, how difficult it would be. Because as I said, my parents uh, had that experience as well. Samantha, I know that um, we thought uh, that we will go another round, but I, you, I mean, your po poem was very short. Do you want to go over one more poem if you, if you like, and then and, get, and then go to professor? Sure, yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, I can read a poem that I was written from a personal perspective. It's called Established. Um, sure. I wrote it a few years ago in regards to a trip that, uh, a move across country, not a trip, um, <laughs> multiple trips in terms of seeking out a new environment um, where my husband and I felt would be a healthier environment for raising our two boys. Um, sure. And we moved from the Mid-South, we call it, <laughs> um, not quite the Midwest and not quite the South, um, to upstate New York where we are now. And so I wrote this poem. This is about my own personal migration story across country. And I've lived in California. I've lived in Pennsylvania. I've lived um, in Missouri and Kansas. Um, and so, and now I'm in New York. So I think there is a little bit of room in the conversation um, for migration, um, even if it's not immigration moving right. between countries. Um, and this is established. As children, weren't we all beguiled by water lilies? I was sure the little rafts were stepping stones for traipsing across, sufficient to support my weight. Although they are well established, rooted deep beneath water bodies, on the surface they are delicate creatures, it seems. You once asked me if we wanted to keep trying to put the tent pegs in, only to have them continue to slip out again. I'm grateful I learned the difference between solid and superficial, and that we too can be fastened tight to the ground, more securely established than I might have imagined. Very nice, very nice. Thank you, yeah. yeah it's kind of little different flavor, kind of more as moving within the country, but yeah, what is your feeling? That would be absolutely great. So, so Professor Pascal, do you mind to um, read another poem? Yes. Uh, this one is, uh, the title is Green Trunks. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are two trunks that uh, we used when we moved to Canada. Okay. Then I used uh, to move myself down to California, and I still have them. Green trunks. Two green trunks have sat empty for decades in the garage, high up on a scaffold. They haven't changed much and carry the scars of their transatlantic voyage, hauling our possessions from one continent to another. Possessions is too large a word to contain what they held. Blankets, sheets, pillowcases, tablecloths, towels, some items of clothing, dishes, cutlery, a few books, many things made by my mother with her cousins, her sisters, my godmother. Many things passed down from generation to generation, from household to household. Those trunks and what they carried accompanied us abroad are what we were and how we have become. They are the places we have inhabited, signify familiar and familial ties the two empty trunks sitting up high on a scaffold are family history and contain the air of passing. They have traveled a long distance to a place of arrival, a place of new residence that holds the opportunity for a new familiar. That's it. Thanks. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Um, very nice. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I, I, I mean, yeah. So, when you end the Thing that a place of new residence that holds the opportunity for a new familiar. Yeah, obviously many of us and does that way, but I, I always believe, um, or maybe I'm asking question that for the first generation, 
do they really say the say, I'm not the second the first generation migrant do they really after a long time migrant in a new country I truly feel happy and blessed or there is always a longing of what they are missing I mean what is your feeling or any of the today's speakers you can um, ex express your feeling yeah yeah I think as you get older you probably if you're more, more nostalgia right I think uh, uh, it's probably best to um, feel at home when you're getting to that stage and uh, hearing your own language, right. being able to move in an environment that mm -hmm. formed you at a certain point. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know if it's a, a nostalgia based purely on romanticizing the other place because you, in fact, you left it and right. we left it for economic reasons. And so Correct. it right. wasn't offering us anything at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but I think the, the, the fact of, of, of hearing your own language and being in your own culture where people uh, do things in a similar manner <laughs> is mm -hmm. always uh, refreshing. Um, so Patrick, um, um, why don't you also, I know that you probably uh, have another uh, translated poems you want to uh, uh, recite today. And so if you, if you could do, I would really appreciate that. Okay, okay. Um, yes, I prepared a second poem, which was published with the antonym, or it's going to be, uh, okay. um, oh, but okay. uh, this body passed me, which is by the Moroccan poet. Um, and he's got a very difficult name to pronounce. Um, Ab Abdelatif Labi, who is a Moroccan poet, born in 1942. Um, he, just very briefly, um, he founded a journal called Souf and also another association, both of which were targeted by the government. And he was imprisoned, he was um, sentenced to, um, to prison for 10 years for, for crimes of opinion. And in 1980, he moved to France and has now as a permanent resident in France. I've met him a couple of times and translated him for the anthology that, I, that you mentioned, plus um, uh, Biswadeep asked me to do um, a few poems for the antonym. Um, so I'm just going to read one poem. It's a little bit long, but I'll go quite fast. I think it's quite, it's very long, thin verses. So, this is a poem which is called um, Hypothetical. I could have lived another life, the opposite of the one I lived, been born in another time as distant as possible, to be born by a non-human mammal, aquatic for example, emerge from a seed buried in the ground and grow a tree, any tree at all, be ejected by a volcano to cool down, solidify and become a rock. What? I could have lived only the ardent seasons of life, the age of the first words of native sorrows and joys, the burning, wild and refined months of mad love, the time of dreams just as crazy when we reach for the moon without a second thought, when we tell ourselves that the bad days will end the next day for sure. I could have kept my mouth shut, shut up for good, to spare my fellow men such a lament arm myself with the silence of those who know of the sea, only the enemy waves, who know of the sea, only the enemy waves and the graveyard of the deep, those who in the icy mud wash their faces with the blood of barbed wire, those that everything accuses and condemns, name, colour, language, country, the misplaced pride of women, of men, the indecent fertility of women, those who speak to us eloquently through simple gestures of snapshots taken without their knowledge, dead or alive. I could have not been there this morning, peering into the night, in the light of day, confounding my little tragedy with the immeasurable tragedy of the world, scratching, scratching at paper, instead of blowing, blowing into the gigantic horn of anger until my lungs burst. I could have taken refuge in a cage, sealed the entrance, to practice deafness, blindness, insensitivity, to end with the din of images and deliver my memory 
to the great repairman that is oblivion. I could have not existed, neither before nor after, the only dormancy, supposition and nothingness, an improbable particle, forever immature, e finita la commedia. Beautiful. Wow. Fantastic. Very intense. <clears throat> very intense, yes. No, very intense, yeah. So, so you, do you translate more of this poet, uh, Abedelative Labi, or you did, only you did this one? Um, I did some of his work for the anthology. Um, okay. I did some for the antonym. And um, there's another project that I'm going to embark on for a, a, another magazine in the UK called The High Window. And okay. it's very likely that I will take more of his work because he's one of the representatives of uh, Moroccan poetry and the, the situation in North Africa, which is um, never very good in Morocco and especially at the moment in Tunisia. Um, again, this is kind of like talking about the poetry from the point of view of the countries where a lot of the people um, have to exile themselves or wish to leave from. So you're going back to examining and criticizing the actual um, structures that created mm -hmm. some of the migration in the first place. So it is very interesting to, to look at it from that angle. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. It's very nice. Um, so we are. Um, so um, I know that um, we, you are all um, time sensitive. So we are all kind of coming to almost the end of this program. But uh, Samantha, I, uh, I would like, if you don't mind, can you uh, read one more poem, and then maybe we can wrap it up. Sure, I would be honored to, um, and I would. Uh, just want to say thank you so much again for just allowing us to share and sure. and allowing me to be involved in the conversation. Well, absolutely, um, I mean it is very enriching for me too. Also, I'm listening to so many different type of migration problems. It's very much enriching for me. For me, I really love this. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So this is becoming the family tree, and it is also forthcoming from the antonym, or possibly has maybe recently been posted there. Um, okay. And this deals, just briefly, I'll explain that it deals a little bit with um, a challenge that my family has experienced, uh, my extended family um, has experienced in trying to trace our roots, because that's one of the things that can get lost. Um, and, and I get nostalgia for places that I don't know. Pascal, I loved your explanation. Um, and that makes perfect sense. But um, having been in America for as long as my family has. Um, it's taken quite a bit of work um, that my mom has done. And she has, when I was smaller, she um, would drag me along places, you know, I was a little begrudging. And now as I'm older in my 40s, I have a lot more appreciation for, for genealogy. Um, so this is called Becoming the Family Tree. And I wrote it for my mom. You trace the lines of your heritage across the miles, over county maps, and through graveyards strewn with leaf litter, to tall grass. You teach the names of ancestral lines, sorting through broken framed photos. We learn names of places to match the faces on the family tree, delineating regions and times. Here's an old farmhouse painted blue, where an ex-con now lives, an acreage where a home no longer exists. Miles are traveled, names repeated, mysteries elucidated, at least until we too become the leaves strewn. Very nice, beautiful. Um, <clears throat> I have one one question that I mean obviously the uh, just hold on um, that um, as we do this uh, immigration migration the family heritage I mean now I see that a lot of time people um, 
kind of when they come to at least the United States, um, they almost they change their name, the way they pronounce their, everything like that. So, so I mean, whatever reason, probably it is easy professionally or to introduce yourself or I mean, many people are doing that, though I don't uh, like that. Um, but um, so do you think that ultimately these family heritage, these things will be actually, we are losing that as more and more immigration starts or, or do you think that is good or bad? I'm, I'm, just, I'm just curious to know your, your thinking on that. Uh, I, I wish that my family had held tighter to some of the heritage and I realized mm -hmm. <laughs> that's difficult over the course of, and I say 200 years, 200 plus years, 200 to 400 years, Mm -hmm. your your ancestral lines just get mixed into um, American culture mm -hmm. and there's definitely room for that and I, I am a proud American I'm happy to be an American and right. um, and that's and that's fine too and I think that um, it's great to be um, happy and comfortable and at home wherever you are. And I'm grateful for that. I didn't have to deal with immigrating or being forced out or exiled um, from another country. Um, but there is a piece of me that wishes that I had more understanding and more cultural appreciation for the places that my families, my dad's side and my mom's side came from, which is Scotland, England, um, okay. Ireland. So okay. um, I wish I knew more. I wish I had been to some of those places. I wish I had stories that my grandmother might have told about her grandmother or something. And okay. I think families in America probably do that. I think some do. But, um, and that's, it's great to have maybe a balance if, if you're an American born citizen to, um, to have the heritage and then also an appreciation for where you live and where your family is now. Um, but I, I am in agreement with you, Jishnu, good for you keeping your name, not trying to change um, to <laughs> Americanize it and to Joshua or something. Right. Um, <laughs> good for you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, thank you, yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> That's very good. I think it's very, um, I think we are almost, um, the um, end of this discussion. Um, any other thoughts from Patrick or Professor Pestel? As you see, I kept my name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> always under duress, but I always struggle. So what do they call you is always the question. Well, they call me Pasquale, <laughs> so <laughs> deal with it, right? And it doesn't matter how it comes out, but that's what I kept. Right. You know, I feel you know what uh, what you were saying, uh, Samantha, about uh, about that. I feel it with my own children uh, that that's already beginning. Um, my wife is not Italian; uh, she's Dutch. Uh, but I feel with my children who have uh, Italian names, uh, Giuliano and Mara. Uh, but uh, I feel that uh, something. And again, maybe it's a uh, it's a function of my age and my own nostalgia that I feel that, that those things are, are loosening up a little bit. And I hope that they maintain touch with their, with their cultures being more than just Italian. Uh, but with my grandson, I see that that's not necessarily going to, to happen at all. Uh, and so all this, the integration, had I been in Italy, it would have been less of <laughs> a concern, of course, right? <laughs> but uh, being somewhere where there are people from so many parts of the world, it's uh, it's difficult to maintain a touch with one part of yourself or another, I think. It's a wonderful thing, obviously, uh, because it enriches so many things. But I'm very much attached to, as you see by my name, <laughs> to my background. But I do feel that it's, uh, it's diluting uh, very slowly and it's going to disappear extremely fast. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, so um, basically, thank you for all of you um, for contributing this. Um, from behalf of Antonim, I really want to thank you. Uh, I just thought, though we had the poetry session, I kind of researched a little bit, a couple of statistics, maybe dry thing for, for migration. I would... Uh, finish this conversation and and again uh, thank you very much for 
Um, so one of the things which I noticed um, is that just a pure number, basically, the number of international migrants globally in 2019 is 272 million. That is almost 3.5% of the population. And out of that, 52% is male and 48 female. However, and overall, 74% international migrants were in working age, kind of 20 to 64. Kind of, it shows the trend that you, you're probably going for a better work or whatever. And India, where originally I am from, continued to be the largest country of origin of international migrants. And um, India had almost 17 from 5 million migrants, followed by Mexico and China. And the top destination country remained United States, almost 50.7 million international migrants. So I thought that's an interesting uh, <laughs> kind of statistics about migration. And so again, so this is uh, Tishnu Sen. And thank you again. Uh, we say in Indian style, namaste or anyhow, thank you. But very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Hopefully uh, you all enjoyed and the audience will enjoy and we can do more of that. With this one last um, signing off, I one, one last note is that what would happen if we erase all country border and let people leave wherever they want it? Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Samantha, bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.